Well, hi, David Lindo. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you online and um, to talk about um, your, your virtual visit with Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society on Tuesday, um, June 2nd at 7.30 EDT uh, at our virtual conference center, which anyone can access off the wcaudubon.org homepage. So anyway, welcome and thanks so much for taking a little bit of time with us today so that we can um, catch up with you and find out what's new and uh, talk about what you're going to be talking about when we see you again. Anytime with WCS, sorry, WCAS and with you, Betsy, is time well spent. Uh, well, thank you, David. Well, we, we surely miss you in every way. Um, you know, everyone had such a fantastic time flirting with you last November in 2019 when you came and were with us for over a week. Um, that, was, that was just a memorable occasion and a memorable series of days. Everyone had so much fun. And you really were a spark plug. You really lit up the entire region uh, from, you know, youth to communities to organizations to everybody. There we, we had so many people involved and uh, they just wanted to meet you and go birding with you and learn much more as much as they can, could about urban birding, which you're, you've spent your life and you're dedicated to. So I thought maybe um, this morning we might just talk just a little bit about. Um, I know you're gonna you're gonna be talking about the basics of urban birding uh, when we see you for the speaker program. Can you tell tell us a little bit more about what what you expect that'll be about, or maybe some of the highlights? Well, it's going to be uh, an introduction uh, to the idea of watching birds in urban areas, and it will start at the very beginning as far as I'm concerned with the actual concept of urban birding. What is it? You know, what, 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 actu what action actually is urban birding? And I will say that it's predominantly um, a, well, almost spiritual. It's all about opening your mind to the idea that there's nature around us and it's, uh, it's about connecting to nature. And it's about initially realizing that there are or there is wildlife around us, you know, birds in particular, and not to worry about what those birds are called initially, just connect to them and to teach yourself to be able to do that because that's not something that comes overnight. You need to actually think about it and, and work at it. And once we get over that scenario, then you begin to realize that, you know, you actually can notice birds on your way to work, school, or to the store, or what have you. Then it's about how to then watch them, you know, what, what, where's the best places in an urban area to watch birds, and how can you attract birds to your yard if you've got a backyard, um, so that includes feeding. But then on top of that, we'll talk about binoculars we'll talk about how to use binoculars because people think they can just pick a pair up and use them immediately but um, there is an art to that as well because it's all about hand-to-eye coordination um, and then we'll talk about field guides using guides bird bird books and I'll offer my hints as to how to use them because many people think that using a field guide is the Bible you know, if it's not in the book, then you can't have seen it. Whereas the guide, the guide is just that. I don't know if you can see that. It's just a guide, you know, because no book can show all the different variations of plumage that a bird may have. So it's about using a field guide, but also using your own, your own mind, using, making notes, basically. Just trying to describe a bird you see using your own words and not the words written in the book because they're the best ways of learning when you actually describe, you know, if you see a chickadee, you describe it as you wanted to describe it, how you think it looks, not how the book tells you. Um, I think those are very good ways of actually learning. And then um, from there, it's about um, joining up with other groups, such as obviously, uh, as you guys, WCAS, you know, joining up with you guys um, to go out and field trips. So, you're going to start from 
very basic knowledge and then graduate into going out with people to learn a lot more. So that's essentially what it's going to be about. Um, I've given this uh, talk, this virtual online talk, uh, a couple of times, once to uh, some people in Germany. And again, the people that came were very kind of curious people. Some weren't even birders at all, they were just curious. Um, but they left feeling very excited um, and wanting to learn more, you know, even wanted to go and buy a pair of binoculars to start their hobby. So it's going to be very non-technical and maybe at the end, if there's possibilities or even during it, there'll be times for questions as well, because that's what I did and have done the previous ones. This, this whole kind of program was designed to, to have a, an interactive thing the whole way through. So we can talk and ask questions during segments of the actual um, the, the seminar. Uh, that sounds wonderful. I love it because it has such a wide appeal, um, you know, that anyone who is interested in it can participate in some way and start to learn, as well as uh, it's uh, really great for people who live in urban areas and who may bird um, or not. So that's really great. Thank you. That's, we'll, we'll be looking forward to that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in our new era of COVID-19 and how that's affected, how you've been affected by that? Um, what changes have come about for you or what, what are you noticing and how has that, uh, how has that even changed your, your, um, how you think about birding maybe? Um, yeah, very interesting question. Uh, it's affected me on many different levels, not only on a personal level, but also on a level looking at other people. On a personal level, I'm actually still in lockdown 70 odd days later. I'm in Spain, uh, in my apartment, which is good news, not uh, somewhere where I, don't, I didn't want to be. Um, and at the moment, I'm only allowed to be out between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. or 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. and during the interim time I can go to the store but that's about it so I always make sure but I have a, a shopping bag with me when I'm going out during the curfew hours in case the police stop me because the police in Spain are quite stringent they are actually fining people for breaching the, um, the arrangements and um, I think they've I've heard that they've actually issued up to three quarters of a million uh, tickets around the country since the whole thing started and the, f the fines range from 600 to a thousand euros which is a lot of money for many people living in Spain because you know the, the cost of living is quite low here and people most people don't really get much money so it's been a very good deterrent and actually I feel bad for a lot of Spaniards because they're very social people and to be locked in their homes several generations locked in the same place and kids not were not allowed out until literally two weeks ago and that's from the beginning of March all the way to just two weeks ago so that's just shows you how tough they are they're seeing this so it's affected me because obviously I was between March to July supposed to be all over the place I mean I was supposed to be in Jamaica I should have been finishing a tour of Serbia today, funnily enough. Um, I should have been coming over to Ohio. I to know. With my new family. <laughs> right. Um, and I would have been in England as well because I had quite a few events, um, including my own event, the London Wildlife Festival in July. And I wouldn't have been back in Spain until July. Mm. But then who would have known? I mean, I did at the time before the COVID um, lockdown happened. Um, I was actually in Spain anyway. I was on a, 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 um, a press trip. I was uh, invited to Salamanca, which is um, just southwest of Madrid, to, uh, to explore that region and write about it. And during the course of that particular field trip, it was cut short and they said, you better go because the police will be locking the place down. So luckily I got an apartment, so I drove down to my apartment and that was it. So my birding has been very limited. I mean, I've got, um, I've got this three-story apartments. I've got quite a lot of space. I'm on my own. That's another strange thing, being on my own. 
no physical contact with anyone. I've not touched anyone um, since late February. It's just <laughs> unreal. But anyway, I mean, I don't mind actually being on my own because I'm with people all year round. And before all this happened, I was actually thinking, oh, it'd be great to have two weeks. I could stay <laughs> in my apartment in Spain. All right. And, and then go back into the rat race again. And I was getting a bit tired of traveling as well. So it looks like something out there said, right, well, okay, you can have that, but in spades. So, um, yeah, so basically I've got a sun terrace and my sun terrace, the vista, is basically rooftops, chimneys and satellite dishes. No, there's not a lick of green anywhere. And I live in a city called Merida, which is the capital city of a region called Extremadura, which is a region which sort of butts onto the border of Portugal. It's in southwestern Spain. Uh, it's landlocked, so there's no beach or anything like that. And the region is just a little bit smaller than Kentucky, so it's quite a big spot. Um, so anyway, the city itself is a great city for birding because it's, um, it's got a river that runs through it called the Rida, River Guadiana, um, which runs all the way into Portugal. I'm not too far from Portugal, and it runs into the Atlantic. So along the river, there's lots of interesting species, and my patch actually is right in the center of town along the river there's a park and I used to go birding there but where I am here is literally I mean it's I can walk to the river in 15 minutes but prior to that when I couldn't go anywhere I was just stuck here and in in about 60 odd days I saw 40 different species of birds including 10 species of birds of prey wow um, um, the most interesting was a species called the uh, Eurasian stone curlew, which is a type of shorebird, and I heard it calling at 1.30 in the morning. I had to finish watching Ozark and, <laughs> and open up my window to the street and I just heard it calling as it blew over. Oh. Um, so it was tough just being stuck here. Mm -hmm. And two weeks ago when the government said that you're allowed to go for walks, I celebrated on the day of going for my first walk, I remember getting up at, well, leaving the house at 6.30, feeling very appreh apprehensive. I felt actually almost agrophobic because yeah. I've been indoors for so long. Right. And you were only supposed to walk for one hour, and I was out for three and a half hours. I did the whole stint, and I walked. I mean, I worked out, but my average um, steps per day were between 750 to 1,000. On that morning, I did 14,000 Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, but during the course of that walk, because I walked all the way over to this creek on the edge of town, mm -hmm. and I saw some great birds in the way. It was just great to see birds that I should have been seeing, but because I'm so in the concrete here, and there's no, I can't hear any birds on because the nearest park is quite far, and now it's a pier shot. It was like a, an amazing, it was like drinking honey or, you know, nectar <laughs> because I was but the thing is, um, during the course of that, my hips began to feel very tight and painful. And my Achilles started to be you know, painful as well. And when I got back home, I could barely walk. Um, <gasps> oh. And I was actually laid up for, in fact, I've only just got over my Achilles now. And my hips, I had to use yoga to open them up again because my body had not been used to walking. And it's funny, you don't really realize that if you don't walk, right. you kind of don't use muscles. You know, you think you're walking up and down and that's fine in the house, but right. you actually do a proper walk. So <laughs> no, one told me, no one told me about that. So that's one thing I've learned from the COVID thing. Um, but what's interesting, apart from the fact that, you know, it was quiet, was that I was thinking globally about the fact that because there are less people generally around, it must be very good for birds and other wildlife because they were encroaching into the areas that were normally occupied by people. The most classic areas I can think of were shores, the shorelines. Mm -hmm. um, I know in the US a lot of beaches were closed and I was hoping that lots of shorebirds would be nesting and terns. Um, and I just prayed that uh, they were given time to raise their young before you know, lockdown or people started coming back, coming back from lockdown. But the other thing I noticed, particularly in the UK, that people were contacting me the whole time, not just people I know, but people I didn't know, and the media. And that was that um, people were saying, oh, there's so many birds, I can hear so many birds. 
And in reality, they could hear so many birds because they were stuck in their homes and they never normally you know, sat down in the garden for longer than 10 minutes. So to be there every day, day in, day out, you soon realize that, you know, actually there's a lot of things around here. And yet the interesting thing is, I mean, obviously the birds were singing and there was no background human hubbub to block the sound out. So it sounds much more vibrant. It sounds much more uh, in volume and, and numbers of birds. But an interesting thing to think about is that the birds themselves were hearing more because normally the sounds of other birds were blocked out by traffic and planes and shouting and stuff. So they themselves could hear other territories, which made them even more vigorous thinking, you know, I need to defend my territory. There's many more males around here than, before, than I ever you know, imagined. Right. I, I actually experienced that because I remember going up into my sunroof because what I used to do was to leave my phone out overnight to record night sounds. Mm -hmm. I didn't get much, but what I did notice is when I went up at five in the morning or six in the morning, when it was just getting light, the sound, I mean, we have the blackbird here, which is related to American Robin. So the sounds, I must have heard about 15 or 16 different males within earshot and all singing at once. It was just incredible to, to hear that beautiful sort of song going on all over the place. It was incredible. So the way that, I mean, this COVID has been obviously awful for, for many people. And obviously my heart goes out to those who have suffered or lost one, lost loved ones um, because of it. Um, and also jobs, you know, losing jobs, the economy is just falling on the floor. But on the other side, um, it's been a bit of a blessing for me in many ways. One, I've been able to catch up and actually really become, this is probably the most creative I've ever been in my life in terms of seeing how things will move forward. And I, you know, it's interesting to think about how things will move forward. I think that, you know, international travel is going to be suffering. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of birding, people are going to probably spend more time locally or at least in their own countries for, for the foreseeable future until a vaccine is found. Right. And, and I think that, you know, it's going to make people realize, and especially having been at home for this time, people have realized that their local area is actually quite interesting because I've heard countless stories of people finding things I never expected. For me, it's obvious because urban birding is all about that. Urban birding right. is actually, instead of going out into the middle of nowhere, you are in the middle of somewhere. Yeah. And you start to realize, you know, and I realized that a while ago. So people now are realizing that now. So I'm hoping that there'll be a, a, a a, a, a surge of interest which I have noticed already actually because I've been getting countless people coming to me and saying oh is there a book on urban birding that I can use <laughs> so yes spend, it's a wonderful book <laughs> well actually I'm spending the summer um, I'm writing three ebooks before Ooh, September I'm, that's I've, already started, yeah, I've already started one which is on uh, just photographs my, my photographs but the next one's going to be a very quick and easy guide to how to urban bird which will be international, which will be available from my site hopefully by September. So that's one thing I'm definitely doing. Um, so what I've noticed, as I said, I think that people are becoming more focused on their local areas. Um, and in terms of creativity, I'm, I've been thinking of lots of different ideas. And one of them, which I'm, I think maybe the third question you can ask me anyway, was to create this series of webinars called In Conservation With. And many people think, oh, should you not say in conservation, in conversation with? I said, no, it, it is in conservation because mm -hmm. I'm with people who are also in conservation. They're in the conservation world, whether they be an author, a tour leader, you know, a, a, an ornithologist, a, a thinker, a, a writer. You know, it's all these things that I, I just wanted to, uh, to explore because I don't think there's anything out there that I've ever seen in that, in that fashion. And what's interesting, I've now, I had the idea, what, five weeks ago? A week later, it was up and running. I found out about Zoom, took the risk, you know, and so far so good, touch wood. But the interesting thing is, it made me realize just how many people I know, and more so, how many people said, absolutely, you know, that I'd love to do this. And I have, you know, I've had some really interesting people um, including some really good friends of mine in America. Um, you know, Drew Lanham, 
Jason Ward, um, Sharon Steitler, to, to, to name just uh, but a few. So, you know, I've had a lot of people on and there's a lot more people to come. Um, and it's been interesting because I've developed an audience that listen to this now or watch the whole thing. And they've all learned something because it's a very free and easy conversation, which normally starts off with that person's background, so that you get to know them more personally. Right. And then we talk about their work, you know, we just talk about how did you how you do work. So it's been really interesting, for example, to have had to have had artists on. I mean, there's a guy called Lars Johnson, who's a very famous European artist based in Sweden. Um, and you know, to, to see his sketches and to, for him to talk about his processes. And I got him to have a camera on himself, a phone on himself, then another phone on his work. And because I'm a, I'm a host, I can then sort of switch between the two. So nice. when, I, when, I, when I do the playback, um, it actually, um, you know, it looks like, it's almost like a TV thing, almost. Um, but. It's really fascinating and I, I love that. You know, it's really interesting just to talk to people and ask them questions that, that I don't normally get asked in these kind of circumstances. Because normally, you know, when I watch other people's interviews, it's all very kind of, you know, very easy and technical. Well, it's easy to predict what's going to come next. Whereas I like to ask a few sort of more searching questions, which by the way, I discuss with the person beforehand before we go on. It's no surprises. And at the end, there's a bit of a light-hearted, you know, what's your favorite bird? What's your favorite mammal? Where can you be? Where would you be in the world if it wasn't for COVID-19? Where would you be right this very second? You know, it's, it's stuff like that. And then having people ask questions as well. So yeah, that's interesting. And I, I, I think that this whole episode, far from being restrictive for me, has actually opened my mind even more to, to ideas and how to get more people involved. Um, I'm doing a TV appearance in Britain tomorrow from Spain. Um, they're doing a live Skype and I'll be talking to them about how to start birding, um, which is great because that's one thing, you know, I've noticed that I've been contacted a lot by people in the UK and the media. Can you talk on our radio station, please? And can you tell us about what birds we can be expecting to see in Britain now and all this sort of stuff? So it's really nice. Um, that even though I'm not in Britain at this point, it's good that I'm still consulted to actually talk about it. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's been an interesting time. I mean, personally, it's been you know some days are great, other days haven't been so great. You know, I actually hit a wall at one point where I, I actually I think I became depressed for a few days mm. you know, because not being able to go out. You know, it's amazing. It really does affect you. You know, even if you've got plenty of space. You've got all your books, every, every book you'd ever want. You know, you've got Netflix, you've got <laughs> your work. You know, you can contact people. I mean, the internet's been amazing. You can contact people, you know, but even with all that stuff, you, you know, it still gets to you in ways that you never expect. And as I said, my heart goes out to those who, uh, you know, are in situations where they're cramped in with people who may not necessarily want to be with. But the beauty is, uh, the internet and social media, uh, I don't know where I would be without it. I mean, social media in particular. If, I, if there wasn't social media, I would never be sitting in front of you now, I don't think. I mean, I've used social media for the last 15 years. So I was actually coaxed onto it. I remember a friend of mine said, have you heard of Twitter? What's that? You should be on Twitter. You should be on Facebook. Why? Yeah. <laughs> but then when I went on it, I realized that it's such a, such a great medium for spreading messages. You know, uh, when it comes to birds, I noticed that if, I mean, I have a strategy which I employed almost from day one, because I know it's all about building and building and building and repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating. And eventually things start seeping through. You know, for example, for the whole of lockdown, I've used the phrase, look up. And it, it it's a multi, it means multi, multiple things. It means look up, physically look up, but it also means look up spiritually. It also means positivity, you know. It's a message that I think is so important to give um, because when you do look up and you connect with a living thing, a bird flying past, that's gonna lift your heart and that's gonna help you through, you know. So it's, 
the message is as basic as that, but then also underpinning that is also, you know, getting brand awareness up. It's also making people think about urban birding. It's all these other messages that can be instilled in two words, you know? Um, and I think putting things on social media, messages on social media is so important because after a while, I mean, I noticed from this particular instance, people were expecting the next episode or next installment or the next thing you're going to talk about. Um, so it's really important. I can't under, I can't undervalue the importance of, uh, of social media when used properly. Oh, David, where can people find you on social media? Well, I, um, I come in many guises. Um, I'm, I've got two Facebook, actually three Facebook presences, presence, presences. I've got um, my own personal David Lindo Facebook, but I've got the Urban Birder Facebook, and then there's also the Urban Birder Group. The Urban Birder Group um, is the one that you can actually post pictures on and make comments. And then on Twitter, I've got my, myself, the Urban Birder, I think I am, David Lindo. Um, but then also In Conservation With has a Twitter account as well. And I'm on Instagram as well, under the Urban Birder. That's great. Um, and then can you tell us, um, just I know people were so um, enjoyed uh, your book, The Urban Birder or Urban Birding. Can you speak just a second about your book and tell people where they can get that book? You're talking about the last book, How to Be an Urban Birder? Are you talking yes. About yeah. Well, you can get that book online. Um, it's still available for most good um, purveyors of books. Um, I'm writing three new ebooks at the moment, or one at a time. The first one is a photographic book, it's pictures, well, my pictures, which aren't great, but it's not. That's not the point. My pictures, when I take pictures, for me, it's about trying to show others what they can see with their eyes. It's not about being in a hide for 15 days waiting for two seconds of action. It's <laughs> about walking around without your lens cap on and just taking pictures of everything you see, not worrying about the light conditions or anything, just take the picture and then worry about it afterwards. But even if the picture is blurred, it's your picture and love it. So that's, that's the message with that book. So I'm going to put that out now. I've actually just done some selections of pictures already. The next one should be of interest to uh, uh, WCS, WCAS members, and that is um, that I will be producing a ebook on how to be an urban, how to do urban birding, how to uh, the practicalities of urban birding, very very briefly put. So that'd be a quick one to read that can help you know you get through, and it'd be based largely on the uh, the webinar that I'll be giving for you guys on the second of June. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the third one actually is a bit of a labour of love. It's a, and a book on the birds of Wormwood Scrubs. Oh, patch yeah. In, in West London, and I've been working on this for the last, I say, six years, seven years. Um, it's a systematic list, um, but just a few notes on the species and you know their their status in the area, and um, you know a few notes of how I saw them and stuff. So it's a, it's a personal thing, but I like to uh, I like to do that because I think the scrubs is a very integral part of my history and, and part of the reason, part of the main reason, one of the main reasons why I'm, I'm here as well. So mm. I've got to give back. That, that sounds wonderful. I mean, what a selection and how thankful we are for your generosity and your enormous sense of creativity. That's really great. So is there anything else you, you'd like to add before we sign off? Well, I want to say, I want to send my love to all my friends and family now in Ohio. Yes. And especially in Cleveland. Thank uh, I've got you. A few, there's a few other spots now that um, also um, I've got friends in, in, in Ohio. And I'm really, really looking forward to coming back when all this is over and it's safe to travel. Um, I'm really, really touched that, you know, the urban birding thing has taken off so much uh, in Cleveland, especially. And um, so thank you to all the guys, Tom and everyone else, that, and yourself, obviously, Betsy uh, and, and Gloria and everyone else. And thank you very much for, um, you know, for, for believing in it. And I can't wait to, to return.
Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we can't wait to see you again and, um, and learn all there is to learn from you. And, and we're inspired by your creativity and your leadership and your dedication to conservation, birds and conservation. So thank you so much, David. And we look forward to meeting up again virtually next time on the 2nd of June at 7.30. And again, if you uh, want to come and attend, you just can come uh, by going to the virtual conference center button at the homepage of WC Audubon and um, look for the information there and we'll get it out to you. Well, thank you, David. And we look forward to talking again soon. Thank you.